God does not dish out talent based on race, based on gender. He's, you know, he's not going to say just because you're a woman, all you can do is sing and all you can do is be a, ma a makeup artist because you're a man. All you can, the, the choice, the talent is going to give you is biochemistry and I don't know, chemical engineering or something. So a woman can be a mathematician, a man can be a chef, uh, can be a makeup artist, can be whatever you want. So um, never allow another human being not tell you what you can or can't do because they aren't God. My father told me life is not a bit. This is Origins Africa podcast, where we explore the origin stories of people who have made and are making their dreams come true. Asking the what, the when, the how, and the why. I'm Oshaye, and over the next two weeks, we'll meet Fadil Guru, the founder and CEO of Bookings Africa, a Pan-African on-demand digital marketplace for the entertainment, media, and lifestyle industries. Fade is also the co-founder of Film Factory, a multi-award-winning video production company. On this episode, part one, you'll hear Fade talk about her childhood experiences and how they shaped who she's become today, including her entrepreneurship mindset. Fade will also talk about taking a break from her work at Google in the UK and starting a new life in Nigeria in 2010. This interview was recorded in May 2021. Someone once said that the future belongs to the curious, the ones who are not afraid to try it, explore it, poke at it, question it, and turn it inside out. Today, we meet Fadil Guru, a multi-talented creative who has boldly lived her life exploring her curiosities across media, arts and entertainment, and more recently, technology. From working at Google to fashion design, TV and radio presenting, freelance writing for various publications, and many more. In 2011, Fade co-founded Film Factory, a multi-award-winning video production company, together with her brother, Shesol Guru. They've produced TV adverts and documentaries for multinationals such as General Electric, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, and MTN, as well as produced music videos for some of our favorite Nigerian artists, including Wizkid and Debanj. In 2019, Fade, still following her curiosity, segued into another sector entirely, technology, and launched her latest venture, Bookings Africa, a pan-African on-demand digital marketplace that allows professionals and service providers from Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa at the moment to sell their services and skills online. The platform currently has more than 85,000 users. What is particularly curious about Bookings Africa is that the name came to Fadi in a bizarre dream. Um, so I remember I was basically sleeping one day and I had my t I thought my TV was on and um, I heard a TV commercial. I fell asleep and I heard a TV commercial basically saying, you know, bookingsafrica.com, the number one platform, online platform for, um, you know, service providers across Africa whether you need a model, a voiceover artist, a photographer, a videographer, you're looking for the perfect location to shoot, you need to hire crew, you need to hire equipment, whatever you need, go to bookingsafrica.com. So I remember like literally jumping out of my sleep, like, oh, finally, this is website that would be perfect for um, my production company so that we can use them for, even we had a current job going on where I needed a location. And I was like, oh, great, let me go onto the website to see if I can find this location that I need. And, um, Literally, I woke up and my TV was off. And I thought, wait, didn't I take light or what's going on? And I was like, okay, there's still lights. I don't know what's happening, but let me just check. I remember the name of the website and I went bookingsafrica.com and the website's available to purchase. And I was like, okay, did I spell it wrong? Bookingafrica.com, bookingslashafrica.com. Because I was trying to, I remember Bookings Africa and I went through all different ways of Bookings Africa and it did, the domain didn't exist. So I thought, okay, do you know what? I'm just going to buy the domain name. 
And that was it. That was in 2016. I bought the domain name. Curious, right? More recently, Fade is the Africa chair for the Cherie Blair Foundation and the first African woman to sit on its global campaign board, a foundation that helps discover women entrepreneurs in low and middle income countries. She was also recognized by South Africa's Tropics magazine in their African Doers Power List 2021 as one of the 500 most influential Africans in the world. But let's go back to the beginning, as we love to do on Origins Africa. I mean, that's why we're here, in it. <laughs> now, there are a couple of things to note about Fade's childhood that shaped who she's become today. First, Fade was literally born into the creative industry. Her father, Shesol Guru Sr., was one of the pioneer advertising practitioners in Nigeria. Her mother was also a fashion designer and owned one of the first indigenous fashion houses for kids. So, growing up, Fadi was always around the camera, around music, around lights, around arts. My childhood was pretty interesting. Um, growing up in Nigeria, I was born here um, and then I left when I was about seven, eight. Um, and my dad owned an ad agency. We we're always, he was always filming a TV commercial. I always was around the camera, around music, around lights, camera action. And my dad was really into like live performances, live bands. Like his 40th birthday, he had like, well, what we now call Lagbaja and his band, um, but we just call him uncle. Like, so my dad was even one of the people that founded Lagbaja's band and helped, you know, sponsored his career. So just everything to do with arts, even like sculptures and all the artists that we, the, the famous Nigerian artists, my dad collected art. He, he hung out with all the, everyone. So the whole creative industry was something that I was literally born into. And so from that production aspect and media aspect, You've also got my mom, who's actually also a designer. She uh, made, she had like her own um, store growing when I was growing up. It's called Cool Kids in Surulere. And it was a fashion house and like a salon and like everything for kids, basically. And it was, she was one of the first indigenous brands for kids. Um, and then when I moved to like, London, she actually started making bridal wear. Um, so uh, from that creative aspect, um, you know, both fa- both both my mom and my dad. I think you know, as a as a result, I was kind of like they were the bow and they sprung and the um, the arrow and I shot forward from them. You know, so I feel like they started it off and naturally it was just momentous for m- myself to just carry it on. But it wasn't ever really an intentional decision. I studied journalism in university with Spanish, um, and it's not until like literally I was graduating that. I found out that my mom actually also did journalism. And it's not until I started working on radio that I found out that my dad actually had a stint on Radio Nigeria as well. Are you uh, serious? It's not until like, you know, so I was just, yeah. So it's kind of like you're walking, following their footsteps, but it was so unintentional because I was just like, really, you did that too? Or you were a journalist too? Oh, So my dad was, um, he also wrote for a few newspapers. He worked in a few publishing houses. Um, He worked for grant advertising. Um, So it was just really interesting that I subconsciously or I kind of, you know, segued into my own thing but yes as a result of them um so i think that that in a nutshell is why i think ultimately i'm in media but um practically how i fell into it is probably a bit more interesting second fadi grew up in an affirming household where she and her siblings were encouraged to be curious to figure out what they liked and try to make money from it, to use their initiatives, to always try something new and not be afraid to fail. Evidently, this is the foundation upon which Fade has built her life today. My parents were never one to steer you to study anything. My dad would just always say, 
figure out what you like doing and figure out how to make money from it. Like if you like sleeping, figure out who's going to pay you to sleep. If you like to eat, figure out who's going to pay you to eat. If you like to cook, figure out who's going to pay you to cook. If you like to play PlayStation, figure out who's going to pay you to PlayStation or how to pay you to play it or how you can create your own games or create wealth from it. So we were really just left to our own devices. Like they'd advise us, but they would never force us to study like medicine or law oh, that's or great. anything. So that's we great. never, you know, it was just kind of like, okay, what do you want to do? What are you good at? What do you enjoy? Um, so we've kind of grown up in that kind of flexible, open environment. And I think that really allows us to, um, to really explore what our real interests are and um, what our skills and what we feel our talent is. So my parents would always encourage us to have hobbies and every summer you've got to learn something new. You've got to uh, learn ballet, learn the piano, learn pottery, learn painting, learn how to DJ, learn how to whatever. You have to learn how to do something new every summer and whatever you learned, even if you didn't like it, then at least you've learned that you don't like something, which is learning in itself. So that room of trying something new, failing at it, not being good at it, I think that is a great platform for entrepreneurship because entrepreneurs need to have a thick skin where you want to try something and ultimately, even if it doesn't work or even if you fail at it, you should be able to just brush yourself off and say, okay, well, at least I've learned that that doesn't work. But I find that a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people um, are not um, as encouraged or, or are fearful of entrepreneurship because they're just afraid to even fail or afraid to just try something new. So I've been brought up in an environment since we could walk that you had to try something new. So delving into a new space, whether it's let me live in a new country or let me um, try a new, a new industry that I'm not used to, or let me walk up to somebody who, I don't know, is perceived maybe as a H&I or a thought leader and I've never met them before and I happen to see them in an, in an elevator or in a car park having the bravado to go up to them, introduce myself and offer something of value. A lot of my friends will go, wow, you're so brave. How could you just quote unquote, I don't know, walk up to Richard Branson and introduce yourself. Weren't you afraid? Weren't you shy? And I'm like, no, it's, they're a human being, aren't they? What's the worst that can happen? They'll say, please, we're busy. We're not, we can't talk to you. Okay, well, I I keep it moving, you know. So I never really saw failure as a setback. It was just something. It's just like a child learning how to walk. Eventually, I know that every child is going to learn how to walk, but there's a a journey. You're going to get up. You're going to fall. You're going to crawl. You're going to bump into something. You're going to. But now, even when we, I'm in, in my, you know, once you start learning how to walk, you don't even remember when you started to learn how to walk. And now we just do it naturally. But if every child stumbled every time they were trying to walk and they're crawling, they get up and they fall over. If they just lay on the floor forever because they fell over the first time, they'll never know their potential. Um, so I never really see that stumble or that fall. I never see it as in that's where I'm meant to be. I feel like everybody stumbles, but the whole point is not to lay there. You have to get up and keep going and try again, because ultimately, if you're convinced that something is for you or you're meant to achieve something, it's like learning how to walk. It may take some time, but ultimately you'll get there. So um, that's just always been my mindset. And I think it's a way of my the, the nurture um, that uh, and the, the upbringing that I had. Um, we were definitely encouraged to always um, be curious to always use our initiative, to always try something new. Um, and both my parents being entrepreneurs themselves, I think those are the qualities that they wanted us to have. Third, Fade grew up in a family and network of entrepreneurs. And that played a huge role in shaping our entrepreneurial mindset. In fact, as a young girl, success to Fade meant having her own business. Growing up, I always in my mind believed that being successful meant running my having my own business um because my mama had her own business my dad had his own business then you know my brother had his own business so it was just like the norm and when i came to nigeria every time i'd come to nigeria on holiday all my dad's friends they were all entrepreneurs so even if you look at someone like um uncle Bjordan shobanjo who's the founder of insight and my dad was one of the founders of insight as well so uncle Bjordan is a very close family friend him and my dad are really close 
they're entrepreneurs. I'm looking at like, so all my dad's friends were all entrepreneurs. All my mom's friends were all entrepreneurs. So when I would go back to the UK and I'm like, wait, you want me to work for somebody? Like, hmm, I don't really know how that's going to work because where I come from, we're all our own bosses. So I don't know, that was just always my mindset, even though I moved to London when I was seven. Um, my ultimate goal was always to create something that made me feel like I was never working, but I knew would impact society. Um, I felt like that was just my calling. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Finally, Fade from a very young age while in the UK was identified as gifted and was selected to join a special school, which served to hone her critical thinking and problem solving skills. In Fade's words, she had thought they were being trained to become spies. When I was in primary school in London, um, I had an IQ test done and because uh, my teachers were just like, would, they'd give me homework and I'd always get everything right or, you know, that I'd always know the answers to everything. So they just gave me an IQ test and they figured they somehow, I can't remember what it is, but they said I had a high IQ. So I used to go to Saturday school um, in, actually in Oxford University for a few years because uh, there's something called the Gifted and Talented Register in the UK. Um, it's a small percentage of the population who basically, yeah, they, they perceive as... Um, they've classed as gifted and talented. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, it's a bunch of geeks studying <laughs> on a Saturday. So I was okay. doing that from the age of about, what, 9, 10 till about 14. So I didn't really have a weekend. I was literally on Sunday, you go to church and then you, I'm doing my homework and that was that. When I was in Saturday school, um, I finished that when I was, well, I didn't finish. I left when I was about 14 and had enough. I was like, I need to hang out with my, you know, you're a teenager, like you have birthday parties and everybody wants to do stuff on the weekend. And I'm like, oh no. You decided on your own to leave? Yeah. Cause I was like, felt like my childhood was being wasted, not wasted, but like just swallowed by education or swallowed by school. So you were a teenager. What were the training you, you get for on Saturday? They were, it was a lot of like, uh, um, I think they were just training your mindset on how to constantly absorb and process information as fast as possible and problem solve. So it wasn't a linear traditional method of, of, of education, you know, like the curriculum that you have. So you're going to study maths, history, geography. Um, that really wasn't, um, the curriculum. It was, um, how, how can I, get, an example I can give was maybe they'll split you up into groups and they'll have like 10 pieces of A4 paper and a pair of scissors. And maybe there's four of you in a group and they'll say they want you to fold and cut the, the A4 paper in such a way that it makes like a hula hoop, a circle. And all four of you in your group must all be able to fit into that circle. Uh, and you have I 10 see. tries because you only have 10 pieces of paper. So that's like a warm-up class or they'll take you on a tour of the school or whatever. And they'll ask you like two hours later when you're in a hall or something, they'll just ask you randomly like, okay, how many doors did we go? Did we walk through to get to this draw to get to this, um, to get to this hall that we're in. And they'll ask it to you maybe like three, four hours after you're doing something else. So they were really just training your mind to constantly be aware. Um, I used to tell my mom, I think they were training us to be spies. I was like, this is something I was about to ask like that. Training. It looks like yeah, that. Yeah, I was like, this is like MI5, MI6 trainer. Like, I was so convinced. And she just used to laugh at me. I was like, mom, we're not doing algebra. We're not doing, like, we literally were not doing anything in a traditional form of thinking. It's just always, like, to expand how you absorb information, how quickly you analyze it, how you dissect it, what you do with it, how you store it, how you recall it. Um, yeah. A lot of spatial awareness, a lot of like problem solving, a lot of um, even like questions where there's really no right or wrong answer, but you've got to just literally understand as many, almost like politics, understand as many different yeah. perspectives as possible and try and come up with solutions for. So they would specifically ask questions where there, where there was no right or wrong answer. It was kind of like, um, uh, what's well, the question that they could ask then? Um, things like, even like a religion, something. So, you know, if you've got your Jews, you've got your Muslims, you've got your Christians, and they've all got their own holy scriptures or whatever. So um, 
you know, what would happen if, you know, a Jewish person, like a hypothetical, if this was, if Judaism started in this year and this happened in this year, what if somebody went back in time and they were brought into and then Muhammad went back in time and saw Abraham and did it, did it, do you think that would have affected the did it, did it, did Just something and you're just like, okay, mm-hmm. this is like completely hypothetical. This is like a dystopian, you know, reality, but what would you, what was the scenario and how would that affect today's reality? What are the potential options of how that could have affected reality if there was a time loop where Jesus, Moses, uh, or Jesus, David, and, and um, or Abraham and, uh, and Muhammad were to all have met each other? Like they were able to have their own dinner party and I they all see. met each other. What do you think would have happened and how do you think that would affect 2020? So you then have to start coming up with potential, like how could that could have affected the entire 2000 years or whatever. So it's just like all these ways of things. Mm. So everyone would have their own version of their own reality and it wasn't anything right or wrong. So it was, and then everyone that presented, you then have to like poke holes at it and kind of say, okay, which version of reality would be the most realistic. And like I said, it was just basically tra- figuring, just expanding your mind and how you think and how you, like I said, I really just think they were training us to be serious. <laughs> <laughs> I guess this is one of the experiences you had growing up that really boosted your self-confidence and, um, I mean, helped with you being able to walk up to anybody and introduce yourself. Perhaps. I've never really attributed um, my that, that particular Experience. curriculum or that particular okay. schooling to a personality trait of mine. If anything, I think it affected of more of my mindset. So if you know me, you know how deep I think, you know how quick I, I analyze information. Um, you know, going back to formal education, I was an A-star student. My GCSEs, I have 15 GCSEs. Most people have 13. Everything was A-star. My A-levels, I did. I have five A-levels because I did some of my GCSEs when I was in year nine, sort uh-huh. of year 11. So, and I did some of my A levels when I was in, in doing my some I did uh, did some of my A levels when I was in GCSE. So I was always ahead. I've always so I'm always an A star student, which is why when I wanted to what I wanted to study in university, it was hard because people with the advice, the general advice that you'd get is, oh, do what you're good at. What did you what did you excel in in school? It's harder to answer that when you're good at everything. So if you're thinking, how do I how do I pick a, a subject to study? For you at university and people are taking the advice you're getting is to do something you're good at. And I'm like, well, in a you're modest way, everything. I was an A-star student and everything. So <laughs> that's when I fell back on my father's advice, which is do what you do what you enjoy the most. So at that at that time of my life, I was obsessed with Vogue an ID magazine, Dazed and Confused. I was literally like all the alternative magazines I loved, anything to do with fashion, anything to do with just the glam life or just showing your individuality, which is what ID and days are all about. Um, I really was like, I was drawn to that. And I thought I'd like to shape people's opinion and have a voice in this space. And I really thought that I would be the first black editor of Vogue. And that's why I thought, you know what? I enjoy magazines. I enjoy writing. I enjoy languages. So let me study journalism in Spanish. I actually can speak French and Spanish and I understand Italian as well. So, um, yeah, so that's what informed me to actually study Journalism. I could have literally done anything, biochemistry, if I wanted. Yeah. And I'd probably have still excelled in it and got a first class. But I literally was just like, you know what? What do I actually enjoy? And that I see a career in. Um, and yeah, that was that, that led okay. me to study journalism. Let's take a pause a bit and go back to. So you had said when you were 14, you had decided not to continue that curriculum any longer so you told your parents and they readily said yes and you pulled out or what did you even tell them yeah um i just told my parents i got to the age where i was just like um i started having a bit of more of a social life and i was just like you know i've done this for a long time you know the course finishes when you're like 15 but I, I actually because i started doing my um my a level my gcse's earlier so I started doing it when I was in year nine. I had to start prepping for it. I couldn't then spend all day on a Saturday in a, in somewhere oh, else. I okay. needed my weekends to actually to do the work. So it was an easier sell. Um, and apart from that, you know, my mom would see when like, you know, it's a friend's birthday. It's at this person's birthday and I can never attend because I'm always in school. So I started, you know, I also started stating my claim that, hey, 
I need a bit more of a social life here. Um, so they were fine with it. You know, they were, my parents were, they're quite like liberal in a way. They're just like, okay, you've done, you've done enough. Fine. Mm-hmm. But every summer we all had to learn something new. Yeah. So, um, so you didn't, you didn't just didn't have a summer holiday. So I would always go travel. What did I explore? I think what I didn't explore would be easier. I mean, I've done everything. I've done ballet for years. Um, I did ballet from the age of about seven till about 12, 13. Um, I played the piano. I got a grade oh, four in the piano. I played the flute. Um, I did jazz dancing, street dancing, Which gymnastics, trampoline, really good at- DJing, pottery, painting and pottery. Ah, I see. Do you, do, you, do you know why? I was not good at that. But anything sporty, I was good at. I don't know. Just, just, you just don't have a talent. You don't have a talent. I think I'm more active. Anything that requires you to sit down for too long, I just lose interest. I I'm see. quite naturally, I'm a, not necessarily hyperactive, but I like to, I like to be, I'm energetic. So anything okay. that's too calming or whatever, I was just like, yeah, I know this is boring. Um, I loved, um, I actually love DJ. So I did a Sony, um, Sony music school in the UK. They had like summer courses to learn oh, how nice. to okay. DJ, learn how to do different things. So this is like with actual vinyls. So yeah, I learned how to DJ with actual vinyls for a summer, but I didn't have my own vinyl, so I could never really practice. But out of the cohort of that class, once again, I came top of the class and I actually got to perform um, at a showcase, um, which was really fun in front of a bunch of like the Sony executives. And like we had like a little under 18s party. So that was cool. Um, yeah. Then even learning languages, um, you know, so French, Spanish, I did a bunch. I started doing all of that during summer school. And then I realized that I was good at it and I liked it. So I continued learning it in school. So, so I picked it up like as a subject a in secondary school. Childhood. Um, were there any struggles? Were there any challenges? Absolutely. And we traveled a lot. The challenges for me as a child were probably more personal, more probably more family oriented uh, issues. You know, my mom lived in the UK. My dad lived in Nigeria. So we never really had like a nuclear family, a typical nuclear family household where it's like mom, dad, kids. And my sister, myself, there was like an age gap between my sister, my brother, myself, my younger brother. So whilst I was in the UK, when I moved to the UK at first, it was just my younger brother, my mom and myself, my older brother, Shasson, my older sister, Dami, they were still in Nigeria. So not growing up with your siblings. And then by the time they came, my sister was ready to move off to university. So we never really lived together. So there was those challenges. I wouldn't necessarily even call them challenges. It was just the family dynamics is what I would have, if I could have changed anything, I would have wanted to explore just a typical nuclear family where we all live together at the same time. But at the same time, I think somehow has worked to help us be who we are, which is always a good thing. Um, but yeah, those are the probably like the little challenges and wanting to maybe live with my dad or not wanting to, not, you know, all that kind of family dynamics as a child was what I'd say growing up. And we, my mom always being very religious, she's always um, encouraged us and she, she, she imbibed in us a sense of confidence based on being a product of God, you know? And it's like, God does not dish out talent based on race, based on gender. He's, you know, he's not gonna say, just because you're a woman, all you can do is sing. And all you can do is be a, a makeup artist because you're a man. All you can, the, the, the choice, the talent is going to give you is biochemistry and I don't know, chemical engineering or something. So a woman can be a mathematician, a man can be a chef, uh, can be a makeup artist, can be whatever you want. So um, never allow another human being not tell you what you can or can't do because they aren't God. And God is just like, you know, whether you want to be a football player, whether you want to be a basketball player, whether you want to be an artist, whatever you want to do, you want to be a mathematician, um, do what you love um, and don't let anyone else, a human being is so, um, not necessarily fickle, but we're, of course, we're mortal. So it's only a matter of time until that person is no longer on this earth. So then what does the opinion matter? So never let anybody or never let anybody feel you less than because we're all human beings. Um, so I always had that confidence. And I think also um, 
when you grow up, when I was, when I'd come back to Nigeria and my dad did a lot of political advertising. So at the age of like seven, I'm meeting up with like um, MK Abiola and Baba Gana Kingi Bay. And, you know, so these are the people that I'd go on a Saturday, we're going to their house to have, you know, dinner or whatever, you know, so I'd come back with a, I actually, a, a sense of pride of who my family are. So even if in the UK, you didn't know who I was, I'm like, no, but in Nigeria, my family are actually creating impacts and helping thought leaders and helping nation builders. Um, and we're the backbone of that. We're doing it. So I just felt like I didn't, I had an inner confidence that I never needed. I never sought out external validation. Um, and I think I've always done that growing up. So um, it never, it, it ultimately was a source of my confidence, but in not in an arrogant way or in a, it was just, I am fine to be my own individual, whether somebody accepts me or not, that's fine. Cause not like your opinion just doesn't matter, but really and truly, um, if you don't, if I know like, as long as my intentions are good, um, if you don't um, agree with me or if you don't support me with that, then that's fine. Let's agree to disagree. I'm not going to, I, I don't, I'm fine for people to um, have difference of opinions to what I have, or I, I'm not, I'm not like I'm a nonconformist, but I grew up in the UK. We thrive and we, um, we, we embrace and we celebrate individuality. Um, moving to Nigeria, it's a bit more of a conformist and the collective society. So everybody's always like, oh, look at what your mate is doing. If they can do that, why can't you do that? Look at what they're driving. If they're driving that, you should be driving that. If you're, And they're always comparing themselves to other people. And I never, um, I don't really subscribe to that because I believe that um, if you want to be um, the 1% of the world, um, you have to do what 99.9% .9 of everybody else wouldn't do. So I actively try not to conform too much because I feel like the legacy that I, I that, that, that God has put in, in me is he's only given it to me. So if I'm the only person that's going to deliver something else, I can't be doing something the way everybody else has done it, especially when it's something that has never been done before. Um, so I'm okay to think outside of the box. And then it also goes back to my upbringing in school, where my Saturday school, where we've always been... Uh, taught we've been naturally taught and um groomed to think outside of the box so i can't go around telling this particular story to every person to give them a bit more insight as to um why i'm able to develop mm. solutions and what drives me to develop solutions and how i think so i know that they're just going to be like oh well you do things different why don't you do like i remember when i moved to nigeria everybody just said oh you've got an english accent you speak you speak it really well and you're you're a fine yellow babe so you should be on tv and i'm like Mm, no, I, I, my first job when I left university was with Google. Um, I've been sought after by multinational companies. I really don't think that my only calling in life, because you've, your exposure and your experience has framed that if somebody speaks well and if they look good, then the ultimate, the career path or their calling is media, is, is TV. Um, I'm not going to knock that, just that's, uh, that I, I understand that's your experience and why you think that that's what I'm suitable for. However, I know myself. My, like I said, I've worked for Google before I even moved to Nigeria. So I'm, I wasn't like, I wasn't, it wasn't an appeal to go from that to being a TV presenter. I was like, okay, that's not really something that I'm actively seeking. I mean, I can do it for fun or for a hobby or whatever, but it wasn't something that I was going to indulge as a career. Okay. Um, Curious. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, that's, I think ultimately that's where my confidence comes from. Great, great, great. Thanks a lot. Curiously, who had a greater influence on you, your dad or your mom? Um, gosh, I think equal parts, to be honest, um, because um, I grew up with my mom in London. So just day to day, um, you know, my creativity, my experiences, my belief in my, my faith in God, um, just how to treat people, just showing respect, you know, just being domesticated, um, having confidence in you, myself as a black woman. Um, you know, I got that from my mom and always wanting to be philanthropical and help others. That's my mom and my dad were very, are very into that. So there's, I think I just kind of mixed and matched and picked bits from all of them. Um, okay. But I'd probably say 
I think with na- with nature, I, it's probably my mum. But with nurture, no, no, no. Let me do the other way. With nature, it's my dad. But with nurture, my mum. So I kind of got a bit of both from everyone because there's so many things that I've done in my life that I then found out after I've done it that my dad did the same thing. And a lot of my family and a lot of my dad's friends, they all tell me that I've got my dad's personality. Mm. Um, And that's interesting knowing that I didn't even grow up with him, you know. So um, nature, I think, yeah, I have a lot of my dad's mannerisms and energy level and just, you know, zest for life. Um, And then nurture i think being able to speak to people being able to be confident as a black woman and all of that i definitely think it's uh, my mom okay so you got it my mom never used her gender or her sex or her color as an excuse as to oh they're not going to give me this job because i'm black or they're not going to give me this because i'm a woman we never thought like that we're just like i'm going to get this because i'm the best person for it and so I never saw I never saw gender, I never saw color as an obstacle. Okay. In just a moment, we'll explore Fadi's time at the university, her experience with Google, and her return to Nigeria in 2010. Stay with us. I'm Oshaye, and you're listening to Origins Africa podcast. Hi, dear listener. If you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. You can also send us a tweet or comment on Instagram at Origins AF. We love to read from you. Nope, not later. Yes, I read your mind. Do it now. Thanks a lot. Also, click the subscribe button and share with a friend. Let's make a difference together. One origin story at a time. Catch our one-to-one newsletter where we share with you one lesson, two quotes, and one question from each episode published. You'll find it at originsafrica.substack.com originsafrica.substack.com If you like it, please click the like button, leave a comment, share with a friend, and subscribe. Also, you can now watch video snippets of some of our guest interviews. Simply go to Origins Africa Podcast on YouTube, Origins Africa Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, like our videos and share. Let's make a difference together, one origin story at a time. Hi there, welcome back to Origins Africa Podcast. Fadi got into Roehampton University in the UK to study journalism and creative writing. What was the experience like for her? Wow, uni flew by, to be honest. Um, uni was a breeze for me. I really don't even remember much. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> so um, university was really uh, easy for me. Um, it's just the way I've learned to study. Um, if you give me a... a the, if, you, if I know exactly what is expected of me by the end of the final semester or the end of that specific, specific year, um, and I know what I'm going to be... What, what, what the exam or what the coursework is about. Um, I literally would hand everything in within a matter of months and then I'll just go and work. <laughs> if you start uni in September and you normally finish like let's say June, July and you're meant to have your hand in your coursework, I would have handed mine in around like March and then I'd either like go on holiday <laughs> or I'll just start working. So I'd work full time. So I'd be able to work longer than everybody else throughout the summer. So for me, uni was, I used to tell my parents that for me, uni was just delaying me getting into my career. Um, but if they want me to get a, you know, a d- university degree, then fine, I'll do that. But really and Always truly, I just felt like, did. oh, I, I know that I can do. Wow. Um, I, uh, let me see. I had my own night at um, members clubs in central London. So that was like my evening job. I was a supervisor at Waitrose. I was, um, I also did some work selling cold calling and selling Vogue and Condé Nast subscriptions. I, I've done everything. Yeah. Like I used to, I, I wrote, I freelanced as a journalist and I was published in like South London Press and London Metro newspaper. And so, yeah, 
everything from my formal education, being a journalist and freelancing to just literally looking for whatever would give me a few extra bucks. And I was just monetizing my network. So in central London, I already, I have a lot of, um, a lot of friends who are, um, you know, in the, the upper echelon of society in in London. Um, so whenever we're going out, I'd make sure that they book tables through me. And it was just like going out with your friends for fun, but getting paid to do it. Um, so two or three nights a week, I'd have that. And it would be at numerous clubs. So even if I'm not at the club, I'm still getting paid. Um, so yeah, what else did I do? Um, then of course I was still also doing production at the same time. So I was helping out my dad and my brother when I could. So if I was not writing a script, I was helping to actually produce the, the whether it's the commercial or the music video or whatever project or production we were working on. So um, yeah, it was very versatile. And apart from that, I was also making clothes and making um, home accessories. So I could, I was making a lot of like throw pillows and curtains and oh, personalized see. blankets. And I'll sell that to my friends in school and uh, a lot of, and I was making clothes for them and things and like that. This was that. from what so, you learned when you were a um, kid. Yeah, I always had. Exploring you know, your interest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was just a hobby that I had. And I never really, so that was what I then thought, you know what, if I'm not going to, alongside journalism, which I focused on fashion journalism um, for my dissertation, I um, also wanted to become a designer. So that's how I actually randomly fell into Google because I thought if I'm going to become a designer, I can't afford my own brick and mortar store and stuff. So I wanted to have just an e-store, an e-commerce store. Um, and that literally is why I went to study the Google AdWords exam so that I could be able to run my own fashion line. Um, and then by the time I did the Google AdWords exam, it turned out that I pretty much got 100%. And then they were saying that if I'm interested in working for Google, there's an opportunity. And then I, of course, jumped at it and I started oh, working I for Google. And okay. that's how I never went back into like fashion or fashion journalism. Yeah. But the way life calls you to do something, you jump at it. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. And what was this opportunity at Google? Um, it started off as a SEO account. Um, well, as, as, would it be a supervisor or an entry level for SEO account management? So search engine optimization. So back in the days before digital marketing became really popular, we're talking about like mm -hmm. 2007. Um, if you wanted to advertise on Google, you actually, somebody in Google would actually manage your account. Now, um, everybody outsources that. If you want to have your ads pop up or you can do the Google AdWords exam and you can manage your own account if you want. But um, back then it was literally the, like I, I was um, in charge of FIFA, Marks and Spencer's, F1. I used to manage a lot of their social media, um, sorry, their, their Google AdWords account. Did you enjoy it? Um, so, yeah. Um, I did and I didn't. I don't know how to put it. Um, I did because the opportunity was great. The people were fantastic. Um, it was young. It was vibrant. But I didn't at the same time because, you know, when you're, when you're young, um, you take on board an opportunity. But then after a while, you then have to think, okay, is this where I see myself for the rest of my life? Is this where the best that I can be? Is this, you know, because I like to give everything 110%. So I thought if I'm going to be in this career, this is something that I want to basically almost become the owner of Google. I'm going to work till I'm literally number one or number two and become the new CEO of Google. Is this something that I believe that I wanted to do? And there was just something inside of me that was just like, this is something great for now. It's going to be great on your CV. You're going to make great contact. And of course, even just like the networking from, you know, the owners of F1, because with Google, they would say, if you, um, if you, of course, they sell out your, if you sell out based on their, the Google AdWords that you've done, they'll tend to gift you. So I used to go to a lot of like football matches and Champions League finals oh, and nice. F1 races and Monaco and Singapore. <laughs> and so the other perks were so fantastic, but I'm like, you know, I'm 22, 23. So I was like, this is a lot to do at my age this time. And I felt like I know I wanted to do something that I wanted to do. Um, and I got to the stage where I thought, why just work for Google when I could own Google? So what do I need to do to kind of get to that um, entrepreneurship self sufficient stage? Um, and I felt like in London, you wouldn't really get a chance to explore 
um, your own entrepreneurship because it's uh, the society encourages when it comes to working anyways, it encourages just working for somebody else. It's easier to just apply for a job than to start your own business from scratch. So I only saw in Nigeria when I'm, so I decided to come to Nigeria for a year just to see um, what I could make what of myself. So I took a year out and I thought, and I told Google I'll be back in a year. This was in 2010. Okay. So I'd been with Google for about three years at that stage. Um, and I was like, I wanted to work somewhere else. Well, just travel for about a year, I told them, and then come back. So I never took a gap year and all of that. So they were like, yeah, it's fine. Um, but then I came to Nigeria and then I kind of loved it. And I've been here ever since. And that was in 2010. Interesting. Was it easier just to embark to the Nigerian client? It wasn't bad, actually, because I, I think luckily for me, because I've always been back and forth um, mm -hmm. every summer and every or Christmas, um, I'd either be in Nigeria once a year. So and my dad was very one of those who would bring his work home so I could come home and one day like we're filming in my house or, you know, one weekend oh, we'll see. all go into one of his clients' houses. So I always, always and then, you know, every time Monday to Friday, I'm on holiday here, he's still going to work. So I'd literally go to his office and sometimes I'll work out of his office helping him develop scripts um i'll just go on set just to see what the what projects they're working on so um i kind of always and I, because my a lot of my fam father's friends are in media so um i use for example like danola gray who's a, a social media influencer in nigeria his dad is a very popular um, music composer and scorer for like commercials and for movies and things like that. My dad and Danola Gray have been very good friends. The owner of like TBWA ad agency is my dad's very good friend. The owner of um, Rosabelle um, is actually my uncle. The owner of these are all the like me, STB McCann, okay. Sachi and Sachi. These were all the circle of friends that we had. So for me, it wasn't like, oh, I, I kind of understood it's easy to say you understand the business, but I wasn't too shocked because when they were having issues or when things were going wrong or the generator would not come on on set or you were dead, I kind of had experienced that by just uh, hanging around all this, um, all our family, friends and my dad's colleagues and stuff like that. So, okay. um, yeah, my dad was one of those. He was, he would he, he get us involved in the work, you know? So from a very young age, I remember the first time I was on set, I was probably like five yeah so that's the, my first memory of being on set so from that from the front end to the back end when they're creating the scripts and they're in like their little creative war room i could be eight years old on a summer holiday but i'll go to work with my dad and i'll be in that creative war room with them as they're coming up with concepts and scriptings and you know all of that or sometimes even when people are coming to pitch to my dad um you know for whatever it is for production jobs and whatever i'd also sit there and i'd also watch how people would pitch and how he would interrogate and ask questions and rebuttal and buttress and so that um that boardroom environment was never something that i was uh that that i was that was unfamiliar to me you know I see. Um, for me, it was more about working with the mindset of people that were different to me. Um, I find that I don't want to seem derogatory, um, but when you've so th there's a certain level of exposure when we're talking about, you know, living in a country that's majority in poverty, that's below the poverty line. Sure. There's a certain lack of exposure that those people are going to have. But that workforce is who you need to liaise with on a day to day basis for things to move. True. So it was it was that bridge between my experience, understanding their experience and trying to get to, trying to communicate so they can comprehend and deliver. Um, you know, if you're trying to communicate, if you if you see in color and you're trying to commit, communicate to someone who sees in black and white, you have to position your statement um, a little bit clearer than you might over have to almost like over analyze or over explain. Um, or you have to just figure out how to maneuver and position your communication so that they're able to comprehend it better. Because if you have some red roses, some yellow sunflowers, um, and maybe some white lilies, and you tell the, a black, a class, somebody who sees them black and white, get me the yellow flowers, they wouldn't, and they come and give you the rose, a red rose, you can't get upset because they don't see, they only see black and white. 
True. So True. it might have to position my statement and say, there are three roses over there, the one in the middle, the one on the left, the one on the right. Get me the second rose in the middle. So that way you're not necessarily describing it on color, which they don't see. You can describe you it based on the number, hundred? which they understand better. Yeah, I did. It was a lot of, it was very frustrating because I've always worked, I'm hired staff in Nigeria when I opened up, I moved to Nigeria in 2010 and I opened up Film Factory Productions in 2011. So I've been an employer since 2011 in Nigeria. And um, yeah, it was just frustrating because I'd literally say, give me the red flower and they'll come back with a yellow sun sh- with a yellow sunflower. And I'm looking at them like, are you trying to, are you taking the piss? Are you and you don't understand me or what exactly is the issue here? Like, why would you do something that I blatantly know the answer to, or I blatantly is quite in my eyes is an obvious, you know, um, an obvious action and you still get it wrong. I couldn't understand how something simple as get me the red rose. You could mistake that for a yellow sunflower. So that, 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 um, tra- that, that transition of communication or translation lost in translation, you know, I really had to, skewer my communication skills um, and adapt my communication skills, not necessarily to dumb it down, but just to understand. Did you come um, to the realization yourself? Or did you need to speak with someone or did you read up on it? No, I came to the, I'm a, I'm naturally a solution provider. So I never like to complain about things. I always like to think of what can I do? So I started asking, I started looking at people's behavior patterns and then I see that they did something that I wouldn't understand or I would just see as, irrational or just illogical I'd actually take time to sit there and break and I want them to break it down to me like what was your thought process so I wouldn't tell them that this is a re- at first the first few instances I'd be like why would you bring me a yellow sunflower I told you it was a red rose and you know I'd become a little bit more agitated but then after a while I was like okay this is not sustainable like I can't be you know getting agitated every mm. single scenario let me understand why they bring in me the yellow sunflower so that they don't understand colors. So I needed to understand what it was. So I'd sit down with them. I said, okay, right. When I asked you to bring me this, I wanted a red rose. You brought me this. So explain to me out of all the options of flowers that are here, why did you pick this one? What did you understand that made you choose this one? Then I'll get to the bottom of it, which is maybe they don't understand colors. And I'm like, right, okay, your issues is you don't understand colors, no problem. Now I know when I'm describing something to you, I know how to position and readjust the communication so you can now understand it better. And one person's issue may not be another person's issue. So it was quite interesting just becoming a bit more patient in just understanding the the, the society that I'm now in and... um, like I said, I'm naturally a non-conformist, but at the same time, if you need to, un- if you if you understand how the society does work, you can break the laws. So before you can break a law, you need to understand the law. Sure. That's the way sure. I see it. So it took me a while to even understand the law, and in me understanding the law, it might look like as if I was trying to conform, but it really wasn't. It was me trying to say, okay, how can I be an individual even in the society where conformism is and collective thinking? is the norm and is the way forward. I still need them to be on my side as an individual so they can't alienate me for being too different from them. So I needed to see, okay, what is it? Where, where's the balance? Um, so yeah, it was, it's a bit of psychological. It's a bit, yeah, sure, but it was, it's been interesting. I'm definitely. still learning. I'm still learning. Everybody will always tell you, if you're an employer, everybody will tell you that hiring staff in Nigeria is one of the most stressful things you can do. Competent staff, is uh, they're they're quite rare. Um, And I also blame that to the natural education system and curriculum that we have here, as well as culture, because it it, it encourages lack of initiative, lack of critical thinking. Don't speak back to your elders. Do as I say, not as I do. So why? You shouldn't ask why, just do it. Why do I need to go to bed at this time? Hey, why are you asking questions? You're rude. You're talking back to your father. Go to, you know? So these are normal questions that I, I, we, I was allowed to ask as a kid. Or when you go to school over here in Nigeria, generally they teach you to cram. So you're not necessarily teaching, learning to understand. You're just learning to pass. So that's why they're good at the theory part of it, but they're not necessarily good at the practical side of it because they haven't had any chance to actually um, explore that side, that talent that they have. Um, 
So it, 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 I realized that, okay, if this is the way that they've been thinking and the way they've been brought up since they were a child, I'm not going to change that overnight. Because um, to change the way someone learns and to change their mindset and to change consumer behavior takes a long time. So you kind of have to understand, okay, this is what they've been taught. This is how they behave. So how can I still extract the most value from them that would enable my goals rather than trying to spend so much time trying to teach them? So you have to then weed out the ones that are still flexible enough to be um, not necessarily manipulated, but to be to, 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 to be to be able to be adapt and to meander through different roles and you know and be, I'm willing to learn um, something different. There are people that still have that. And I look for people who are curious, who are hungry, who can say, yes, everything that I've taught, I'm gonna put it to the side and I'm gonna not be afraid to try something new and I'm gonna ask questions. So there's certain ways that I engage with my staff where I ask open-ended questions and everybody has to give their own answer and I never tell you if you're right or wrong. It's just literally, what's your opinion on this? It's like the Moses, Jesus, and you know, Muhammad mm-hmm. situation. Mm-hmm. Hypothetically speaking, what would you do if this came along? And I want to see how everybody's brain starts to think because when there's no right or wrong answer, you're teaching them to just to, to think and not to be af- not to be afraid to think outside of the box and to come up with something wild, um, like a new future. If this was our past. Um, mm. So yeah, those are the things that I still try to do with certain members of my team to to, to groom them. Okay, I heard you say uh, so. Whilst you were at Google, after a couple of years, you started to realize perhaps it wasn't aligned to where you wanted to go, and then you returned to Nigeria. So I'm curious. At that point, what were you looking out for? What goals or dreams did you? Have? Like I said, growing up, I always thought that ultimately the the success, the epitome of success was um, being an entrepreneur and owning your own business and leaving your own legacy in that world. And I felt like Google was going to swallow that up. And also because I never really applied for Google. It was nothing that I'm I'm super grateful that I was able to work for them, Um, but I kind of fell into it. So just after a while, you just kind of think, okay, if I didn't apply, if I didn't get this opportunity, what would I do? Would I still be be a fashion designer? Would I be a fashion journalist working for Vogue? Would I be like, what else could I actually really be? I know I have access to this job, but outside of it, what else could I explore? And um, that's literally what I wanted. I was quite curious to the unknown. You know, when they said the grass is greener on the other uh-huh, side. Uh-huh. So I was just kind of like, okay, I've got this. I know I can get it now. I know I, I can always come back to it anytime that I want. So what else can the world offer me? outside of this um and yeah i just wanted to explore something else because i wasn't i just had this like i said like i was i'm still kind of i'm a big i'm big in individuality and i'm big on entrepreneurship and i just didn't know how that would play out working full-time for google because literally you'll give your life and soul to them because it's really demanding um so i think at that stage i just wanted to i just wanted to make sure that i was on the right path and okay. I thought, let me try something else just to make sure that if I don't enjoy it, because like I said, I've never been afraid to try something else. And people would have been like, a lot of my friends are like, you're leaving Google to move to Nigeria where you didn't even have a I job. Know, right? my friends thought I was <laughs> Everybody thought I was crazy. Like, you don't even have a job where you're going. I was like, nope, I'm just going to see how it goes. <laughs> like, and that's that. And I'm fearless in that way because I always feel like I'll land on my feet, just like the baby who would always learn how to walk. No matter what, even if I stumble along the way, ultimately I will get on my feet. And that's just how I just keep on going. Mm. But there was some, um, I guess there was some, was they safety net of some sort? Maybe some savings she did not work for a while? Or was it that you had nothing and then you took a leap? No, I've always had savings. I've always, um, my parents made sure that we were very financially savvy growing up. Um, for example, pocket money, we had to work for it. So I always understood the value of money. And even like my first car in London, um, my dad was like, okay, whatever you save up, I'll match it. So if you save up one pound, I'll give you one pound. If you save up a thousand pounds, I'll give you a thousand pounds. If you save up 10,000 pounds, I'll give you 10,000 pounds. So whatever you I can see. work to save up, I'll match it. So I never looked out for handouts. 
I've never been the person that's just like, oh, um, so even raising funding for me was quite difficult because I felt like, oh, that's the first time where I'm going to get get money and have to owe yeah. somebody, quote unquote, owe somebody, even though, of course, they own part of, I've given them equity into, into the business. But um, I felt like I was that was daunting for me because it was the first time. I'd, I never even had a credit card because I'd never mm. owed people. So um, I, this wasn't, yeah, that wasn't my lifestyle. Um, so yeah, no, I was, I was, I had my own, I had savings, I had my money. Um, and I was, when I moved to Nigeria, my first job was a freelance journalist. I wrote for, PM and ES. Everyone right from, from PM, from Guardian, from, you know, all the various newspapers. And that's the first half of Fade Ogunro's origin story. Fade returned to Nigeria and started on a new career trajectory, following her curiosity. What was that like? And how was the journey of building Film Factory and Bookings Africa? Find out next week on Origins Africa podcast. Thank you for listening to our show this week. If you liked it, do leave us a review, a comment, and share with your friends. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend and to tell another friend. We would also love to read from you. So please do send us a tweet or leave a comment on Instagram at Origins AF. You can also write to us at OriginsAfricaPodcast at gmail.com. Remember, do subscribe at wherever you get your podcast. Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, amongst others. Catch our one-to-one newsletter where we share with you one lesson, two quotes, and one question from each episode published. you find it at OriginsAfrica.com dot substack dot com origins africa dot substack dot com and of course if you like it please click the like button leave a comment share with a friend and don't forget to subscribe i'm oshaya and you've been listening to origins africa podcast bye for now my father told me life is not a bit of road.